Good evening, everybody. Our top stories. Paul Manafort's defense attorneys attacking the Mueller team, so-called star witness, who once was Manafort's principal partner and associate. The special counsel's case resting on the words of Rick Gates, now an admitted criminal, an admitted liar. And by the way, none of the Manafort courtroom drama has anything to do with Russian collusion and the Trump campaign. Judge Janine Pirro is here tonight to discuss the latest from the Manafort trial. Also tonight, voters casting ballots and primary elections in five states. Polls closing right now in the state of Kansas, Michigan, Missouri, Washington. And in just a half hour, we'll have our first results in a closely watched special congressional election in Ohio. President Trump throwing his full support behind Republican Troy Balderson in that contest. We'll have all of the latest updates for you, as well as analysis from Republican strategist and savant, the dean himself, Ed Rollins, here tonight. And the radical left has gone unhinged and violent, and significant parts of some leftist cities in this country have become no-go zones for conservatives, places where the leftists are assaulting conservative activists. Many attacked and harassed for merrily expressing their views, some for minding their own business attacked for no reason at all. Attorney and California Republican National Committee woman Harmy Dillon joins us tonight. She knows firsthand the depth of the Dems' capacity for violence. She's fighting back in court against not only wrongdoers, but their enablers who in some cases hold public office. She joins us tonight to talk about it, the landmark case that she's pursuing against the city of San Jose and their police department. Our top story tonight, the prosecution's key witness on the stand for a second day in the trial of former Trump campaign chairman Paul Manafort. The defense drilling down on the secret life of Rick Gates. Joining us tonight, Judge Janine Pirro, host of Justice with Judge Janine on the Fox News Channel, author of the number one New York Times bestselling book, Liars, Leakers and Liberals. The case against the anti-Trump conspiracy. Great to have you here. Thank you. The Paul Manafort trial. Uh, Judge Ellis, who has been uh, raising, <laughs> I, I have to say, has been entertaining throughout, uh, and, and even before the trial began. I mean, he is taking over that courtroom. Well, you know, this is a judge who right from the get-go understood what the Manafort trial is about. The Manafort trial is about convicting Paul Manafort in an effort to then squeeze him to turn on Donald Trump. In the end, the jury will decide based upon the facts. But when you have a judge on the bench who even subliminally suggests that he is somewhat critical of the prosecution, in this case, uh, Mueller, uh, it feeds its way into the jury room. Make no mistake about that. And the, the fact that the judge uh, is being so directly critical of the Mueller uh, prosecution team, I mean, he is wasting no words on this, saying point blank. Get your act together. Treat the judge with respect. Uh, attorneys rolling their eyes, attorneys for the prosecution, uh, and uh, not looking him in the eye when he is addressing them from the bench. But you know what is amazing is that this is very much like what is going on across America. It's a microcosm where you have attorneys rolling their eyes, not making contact when the judge is talking to them. That tells me that they believe they have more power than everyone else. And they know that the law doesn't matter. That's what Mueller's team is all about. It's about corrupting lady justice. It's about making sure that they squeeze their guy to get him to say whatever they need him to say. And that's a sad commentary. And this judge is not going to take it. And let's hope the jury you know, recognizes what's going on because the prosecution's key witnesses. You've got the accountant and now you've got Rick Gates. Who got the plea deal? I mean, come on. A, a plea deal, but also an admitted liar ah. uh, and an admitted criminal embezzling, uh, in effect, uh, from uh, Manafort himself uh, and their firm. And, 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 and Rick Gates now is the guy who's going to come in and tell the jury, look, uh, Manafort wanted fictitious loans to lower his tax bill. He was involved in not disclosing foreign accounts. And Manafort was the only one who had control over the accounts. 
when the Manafort defense team is saying, hey, wait a minute, Rick, you were the guy who was controlling the accounts. And by the way, I hate that an accountant says I did something illegal because my client wanted me to. That's hogwash. Right off the bat, I say to myself, wait a minute, you're willing to lose your license because this guy told you to do something? Uh, everybody's being squeezed here. Either because uh, this guy told her to do something mm -hmm. or because the special counsel uh, said, we're going to either take it easy on you yep. or we're going to make it very hard for you. I mean, he has immense power here, right? Uh, tremendous power. I mean, it, everyone is looking to, to protect themselves. These people don't want to go to jail forever. I mean, now you've got you've got uh, Rick Gates, who's got a secret life, a second life, a Guman too. And also, you know, it's like Peter, it's like the whole gang of them. I mean, <laughs> and uh, a lot of explaining to do, obviously, beyond the special counsel and, right. and the prosecution. Manafort is now, imagine this, facing 305 years in prison. Uh, the judge, it seems to me, would be within his rights to say to the prosecution, are you out of your mind what in the world kind of person are you to even think of bringing those kinds of charges? You know what's interesting? Now that Manafort, he's 70 years old, he's in solitary confinement 23 hours a day, uh, while all the other bozos are walking around that, that we have seen them actually commit crimes like lying to Congress. But, you know, when the, at the end of every case, prosecution case, uh, or at the end of a defense case, I should say, the judge has the authority to say that the facts do not support the prosecution's case. I'm going to dismiss this. Now, will the judge do that? Probably not. There is evidence here, certainly, to go to the jury. Mm -hmm. But the judge, if he has a sense, and he's a federal judge, they have a lifelong uh, 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 they're on the bench for life. Right. Nobody can take it away from them. This judge, uh, senior status, as they say, right. uh, he is 78 years old. He is not, uh, he, he's obviously never been anyone's either fool, uh, nor has he uh, sought uh, f favor, and, <laughs> and he sure as heck isn't afraid. I, I just wonder, as you were saying that, whether or not uh, Judge T.S. Uh, uh, Elliott is, uh, in, in fact, laying a foundation for something very similar to that when he's talking about the very high bar for conspiracy here, which is the charge. Uh, he's at the very least sending a very strong signal to that jury when he says these people had to get Gates on the stand, even as they were being ambivalent about it. Uh, he made up their mind for them in a, in a hurry. And we're also seeing, I think, Judge, some sign that Gates is not quite the witness that I'm sure Bob Mueller wanted. Well, clearly, look, when you've got excellent attorneys on the side of uh, Paul Manafort, the guy is a pit bull. You know, when you do a great cross-examination and then the jury starts to say to themselves, gee, you know, he's not as bad as we thought. Is this guy the one who's guilty? Well, actually, he already pled guilty. And then Gates says, I accept the responsibility. I pled guilty. That's hogwash, too. And I'll tell you why. Because he got the plea deal. Paul Manafort did not get a plea deal. All he got was 320 years. You implicate the president or you're going down. I want to turn very quickly to uh, Giuliani, uh, the Trump legal team drafting a letter. We thought we might even hear about it today, that th that letter might be sent to Bob Mueller. Uh, Giuliani talking about their reluctance uh, to uh, be questioned about obstruction. This is a little bit of a change in the tone because uh, Giuliani had earlier said there will be no discussion of obstruction whatsoever to, you know, we're, we're reluctant. Mm -hmm. What's going on? Uh, I think what's going on is w we all know Donald Trump, all right? And Donald Trump, the president, and Donald Trump, the man, is a guy who wants to go out and say, I didn't do anything. And so I suspect that there's some pushback where the president is saying, I'll talk to anybody. And then the legal team is saying, are you out of your mind? These people are looking to hang you upside down in the in the village square. Yeah, he, he wants to have his say. I think as much he'd also like to knock a few heads together out there. In that. Uh, well, I, you know, you can't blame him. I mean, this is a made up a Russia collusion delusion. And, you know, we just find out now that Bruce Orr is dealing with uh, Christopher Steele after Christopher Steele was fired by the FBI. The DOJ is getting information from him. I mean, this and is corruption at its core. You want to talk conspiracy? We can talk conspiracy. Yeah, that doesn't even include uh, Nellie Orr, uh, his wife, wife, Bruce Orr's wife, uh, working for <laughs> Fusion GPS, yep. working with Christopher Steele, the former MI6 spy. Uh, Terrible you, stuff. As the saying goes. You can't make any of this up except 
the very charges with which they created a special counsel. That's the only part that was fantasy. <laughs> Judge, Good great to have you here. You. Thank Thanks so you. much. Judge Janine Pirro, and be sure you watch Judge Janine. <laughs> Justice is with her. <laughs> we'll put it in correct order. Justice with Judge Janine. Saturdays, 9 p.m. Eastern on the Fox News Channel. Thanks again, Judge. The first numbers coming in tonight after voters cast their ballots in five states. The results could be a preview of what's to come in November. We'll find out probably in November. Polls in Kansas, Missouri, Michigan, Washington closing at the top of the hour at 730. We'll have our first numbers from the closely watched special election in Ohio's 12th congressional district where Trump endorsed state Senator Troy Balderson facing off against Democrat Danny O'Connor or Danny Boy, as the president uh, refers to him. We'll bring you the results as soon as we have them. And we'll be talking with Republican strategist Ed Rollins next about all of these races, their implications. And is there any hyping about this thing? Is it overhyped or underhyped? Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Rhino, lame duck, and oh yes, Speaker of the House Paul Ryan telling the left-wing New York Times he saved America from the Trump presidency. If you ever doubted our charge of delusion against the lame duck speaker, in this new interview, he says, quote, I can look myself in the mirror at the end of the day and say I avoided that tragedy, I avoided that tragedy, I avoided that tragedy. Well, he didn't say anything about avoiding the tragedy of his own speakership. Ryan also confirming what we have known for a long time, admitting he often aligns with the never-Trumpers. That should come as no surprise to anyone. Disloyalty from Paul Ryan is an established character and, well, a fact of nature. He did not endorse then-candidate Donald Trump. And when the infamous Access Hollywood tape surfaced, Ryan's response couldn't have been more classically Ryan pompous and sanctimonious. He said, I am not going to defend Donald Trump. Not now, not in the future. That is the only promise that I believe Ryan has ever kept in his political life. Joining us tonight, the dean himself, Ed Rollins, chairman of the Great America PAC, Hall of Fame political consultant. Rollins served as White House political director under President Ronald Reagan. Great to have you here. Thank you very much. I know that you right now are trying to recover from the shock that Paul Ryan could reveal himself to be so sanctimonious, disloyal, uh, and petty and venomous. Well, the president's approval numbers are at 50%. His no approval numbers are at about 25% and dropping. So uh, I think the public, public knows who's the leader of yeah, well, the Republican well, Party also... and, and who basically is trying to drive an agenda through. And I think to a certain extent, uh, Paul Ryan was an accidental speaker. He, he, yeah. and, and, and it was a fluke. And the last speaker, who was not very good either, Boehner, got thrown out. Ryan became kind of a compromise. You know, the president did something else that uh, Ryan's never done. He, he won the state of uh, Wisconsin. Ryan couldn't even win uh, as a congressional <laughs> candidate or a, a vice presidential candidate. And yet he somehow manages, he manages himself as some sort of political force. Uh, as long as he's in that speakership, it's valid. Uh, the day he leaves it. Uh, he is going to be just another rhino establishment toady. Well, he's not going to be looked back on as one of the great, uh, the great uh, legislators of all time. Wait a minute. Let me write that down. Will not be. <laughs> will not. <laughs> uh, what I, will he be seen I, as? I, I usually wait for history to at least get a week or two past the, past the, due, the due date. But I'll, oh, you, I'll make this prediction. Come on. Make you're this you're this being prediction. modest. Make you, this prediction you, right you now. You've spent too uh, much of your <laughs> career creating and uh, <laughs> making history to, to be waiting a few weeks. Well, speaking of history, uh, the president has a big night tonight. He certainly has done everything possible to go out and help candidates, uh, more so than any president, that, and I've done this for 50 years. Uh, he is really giving himself, uh, uh, you know, uh, normally in the month of August, uh, presidents take time off. They go to Martha's Vineyard or Obama went to Hawaii. And, weenie, and weenie political uh, advisors uh, are always telling the president, as right. they did this one, apparently, uh, oh, don't get involved in the primaries. Uh, you know, you're risking way too much. This is a president who knows who he is, what he's about, and has the courage to do exactly what he thinks is right. And who he wants for his team. Uh, I think that's very, very important. I mean, the, the perfect example here is he went into Kansas and endorsed uh, two days ago 
a person who's been very supportive of him. An incumbent, I guess an incumbent Republican uh, who became the incumbent Republican because a lieutenant uh, governor. because he was a lieutenant governor uh, and was sort of the favorite to win this race. So, I mean, that that takes that takes uh, uh, big, big guts to go do that. Yep. And uh, this president is not uh, in any way uh, doesn't in any way have a deficit when it comes to his political courage. Yeah. Uh, and Chris Kobach, uh, the beneficiary of the secretary of state, uh, he's been with the president uh, as the president himself acknowledged very early uh, and consistently uh, in support of the president's policies. Uh, this Ohio special election, uh, Troy Balderson, again, advised by his political advisors not to get involved in the primary. Uh, it, it, this is going to be, uh, it looks like, at least according to all the polls, and by the way, I, every time I say polls, I think of the president's words, you know, fake uh, news and fake polls. Uh, so I, we don't know what to make of it. It looks like a tight race. And it, 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 he's got it, a lot riding on it. Special elections are always disproportionate in the sense of the media coverage and what have you, and this one will be that too. But my sense is a good test of who has a better organization in Ohio. Governor Kasich should be in there full bore. Uh, not only was he not in there early on, uh, he finally did endorse. He criticized the president for coming in there. So, you know, I, I probably trashed uh, the governor too much last night. But at the end of the day here, I don't this, think so. This, yeah. is, this is his old district. He should he should have the, the, the stake in this race. And my sense well, of people of Ohio. The president's organization in Ohio won and, by eight points and beat and, and beat and beat Kasich. Absolutely. So. so. Uh, so I think in that sense, it's, this is a seat. This is one that counts. Uh, 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 and, and, you know, the others are primaries winning the nominations. This this one really counts. This guy gets to go vote tomorrow, uh, whoever wins here. So it makes a big difference. Yeah, it, it's going to be it's going to be fascinating. Overall, what do you think his record will be at the end of the uh, evening? I think everybody endorses is going to win. All right. He's, 40, he's already got 41, uh, four, uh, 11 straight uh, that he's done. So I think he'll have another four or five tonight. Yeah, and, and uh, he does. He's got more than 40 endorsements that have right, uh, right, right. that are his uh, and his win column, and his win column gets so crowded. I would think, you know, how do you keep all of? <laughs> <laughs> and no, nobody's tired of uh, President Trump winning. No, at all. not. He certainly isn't. Well, the country isn't either. Right. Uh, Ed, thanks so much. Thank As you. always, appreciate it. Be sure to vote in our poll right here tonight. It's a special poll. Do you believe the national left-wing media will ever report accurately and diligently on the violent acts of the radical left in this country? Cast your vote on Twitter at Lou Dobbs. And follow me on Twitter at Lou Dobbs. Like me on Facebook. Follow me on Instagram at Lou Dobbs tonight. Up next, the stunning hypocrisy of the Hollywood uh, elites, well, alive and focused on removing President Trump's star from the Walk of Fame. We take it up with the Republican National Committee woman from California, Harmeet Dillon. We'll be taking that up. And how is it that the left is getting away with the violence, whether it's in Berkeley or Portland or San Jose? We'll find out right after the break. Stay with us. A lot, to, a lot to do about sometimes what seems like very little in West Hollywood. The city council there passing a resolution to remove President Trump's star from the Walk of Fame after it was vandalized twice. Uh, the star has become something of a magnet for all sorts of weirdo left-wing lunacy, including this recent <laughs> bloody brawl in which Trump supporters were attacked the Walk of Fame isn't even within West Hollywood's jurisdiction, so it's not clear what effect their vote will actually have. Uh, this follows a, a lot of left-wing violence in left-wing cities all across the country. Antifa demonstrators in Berkeley and Portland, Oregon, wreaking havoc over the weekend. In Philadelphia, threatening conservatives. Candace Owens and Charlie Clark with ridiculous uh, nonsense, uh, trying to intimidate them unsuccessfully. But the fact is they had to have protection uh, because those people were acting like uh, absolute abject fools. Our next guest is leading a lawsuit against the city of San Jose over claims that police there failed to protect Trump supporters from violence during a rally in June of 2016. And joining us tonight is Harmi Dillon. She's the Republican National Committee woman for California and also uh, leading uh, that court action. Great to have you with us, Harmi. Uh, let, let, let's, let, let's start with where you are. You've won an important victory 
uh, with the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals where they suit against the police department of San Jose to proceed. Uh, tell us how important that is and where you expect this case to go. Sure. Uh, Lou, this is an important victory for civil rights, regardless of whether you're conservative or liberal. In our case, we sued the city of San Jose and its police for forcing Trump supporters after a Trump rally into an ongoing riot where many people were injured. The police not only blocked the safe exits, but also stood there and watched while citizens from age of teen to their 70s were beaten up uh, viciously, pelted with eggs, etc. It was really horrifying scene, and I was there. And so the Ninth Circuit has held that we have the right to sue the police for what happened here and the police do not have qualified immunity from suit like they often do when citizens are harmed by the police or by the government because the allegations of the violence as you can see there are so extreme that the police cannot be protected by qualified immunity so the city is now trying to appeal that to the full ninth circuit and uh you know hopefully that will not be successful and then we'll be able to take our case forward in court and prove our case it, it seems that it's pretty clear. It's cut and dry. They were being assaulted and the police were doing nothing but watching. Yes. How could that be? Yes. And you can see that you can see the video. And alarmingly, what the what the city of San Jose actually argued in the Ninth Circuit is that Trump supporters should have expected to have been assaulted when they went to this rally. Now, this is this is un-American. Nobody left or right should expect political violence in our country for assembling peaceably and supporting their candidate of choice. So this is an important victory, regardless of where you stand on the political spectrum for citizens against the government. You know, I mean, I, I can recall vividly uh, my wife and I watching uh, this rally uh, and this violence ensue. Uh, it, it, it was stunning at the time, and just looking at it now, some uh, two years later, uh, it, it's horrifying that this is actually an American city in which law and order was suspended. And you have to ask, where was the mayor? Where was the city council? Oh, uh, well... <laughs> They, the mayor was on Twitter condemning the supporters and condemning Donald Trump for the violence after pre previously trying to discourage this rally from happening there. That's what's so outrageous. The judge did dismiss the mayor and the chief of police from the case, which I'll get to appeal later on. I can't appeal it until the end of the case. But uh, s numerous police supervisors are allowed to be defendants in this case. And, you know, I was there doing the Pledge of Allegiance. I'm an immigrant. My husband is an immigrant. And we were frightened for our lives. This is the type of thing that you see mm -hmm. going on in third world countries. You don't see it in America. And you actually never see it with Republicans or conservatives doing it to liberals. It's a one-way ratchet of violence in our country, and it's unacceptable in America. And, and in support of what you're saying, the violence that uh, took place over the weekend, Portland, Oregon, those, yeah. uh, those demonstrations and those attacks. Uh, and you have to wonder about the power structure, the political uh, structure of the city of Portland. And Berkeley, California, and Philadelphia, uh, all of them left-wing well, led, but it is appalling that they would let this happen yeah. to fellow citizens. Yeah, and you don't even have to wonder. I mean, the mayors of these cities are all very open about their views, very far left, and they encourage this violence. Let's just call it what it is. They tweet about it. They encourage it. And then when the police try to do their jobs occasionally, which actually after our lawsuit they are trying to do sometimes, they get criticized. And, you know, in Berkeley, uh, liberals are attacking the police for, t for tweeting out the photographs of the Antifa people. Tweeting out photographs helps the police do their job of identifying witnesses and so forth. And so, you know, pretty soon I'm sure the ACLU is going to come along and sue the police for doing their jobs. That's what happens. It's kind of a cycle. The police do their jobs. The ACLU sues or other liberal groups sue. The police stop doing their jobs. Citizens get hurt and people like me file lawsuits as well. So, yeah, I, I guess I missed the cycle where police do their jobs uh, in uh, the last couple of years. Uh, because what we have yeah. seen in these cities uh, uh, with left-wing mayors uh, and police departments that serve at the pleasure, people don't realize sheriffs are elected in their own right. Police chiefs uh, have to have uh, the uh, support of the, the mayors and are duty-bound to follow their orders in most cases. Uh, and it's, it's an ugly thing to watch, it, without question. Yes. Where does yes, this it is. And, and, and people should, yeah, people should uh, attend these rallies at their own risk. Do not assume the police are going to protect you, unfortunately. Yeah, I think, that's, I, I think that is sage counsel. Uh, Harmeen, where do we go from here? I, I, what is the solution here? Is it a solely a political solution? That is, uh, 
push the left out of office uh, at the ballot box. Is that the only way to stop this, or must there be more suits like yours brought against the police department of San Jose? And should the Republican Party be doing more of that to protect uh, both uh, our system of justice uh, as well as our citizens? Well, we have to do both, Lou. First of all, we do have to push these people out of office because ultimately the police uh, do answer to the uh, political leaders of these cities. But where is the DOJ? The DOJ is MIA. Uh, this is the job of the Department of Justice in California as well as in the federal government to investigate when the civil rights of American citizens are violated. And our lawsuit is a civil rights case. These citizens were attacked because of who they support and what they believe. And that's that's not American. So, yes, and we could have more lawsuits like mine trying to hold the police accountable. It takes years. It's two years later now since this is the day it. I did that Pledge of Allegiance. Yeah. And we are nowhere closer than, you know, one yeah. hurdle after another to getting towards justice. With, with exceptions, and of course, you are uh, primary among those exceptions. The legal profession is, uh, is, is, is frankly, a, a major, major accomplice uh, in all uh, of this corruption of our judicial system, our Department of Justice, the legal profession itself. Uh, and there has to be an accounting and a and a political uh, response uh, and soon. Uh, and the Republican Party seems to have been flat footed and unimaginative uh, for the past uh, several decades or we wouldn't be in this uh, at least this sorry a shape uh, as a country. Do you disagree? I completely agree with you. The left has a culture of using the courts to advance its agenda. The right does not. And donors are giving money inside the beltway. They are not giving it to lawyers who can help advance these agendas around the country. And we need to do that. The courts are there for us as well. We have Republican judges on the bench and we have fair minded liberal judges. In the case of the Ninth Circuit, two of the judges who ruled in our favor that this case can go forward are not conservatives. And so, you know, we can have a fair shake in the courts, but it does require somebody being willing to invest and go the long haul and citizens being willing to hold up their hands and say, I'm willing to be a plaintiff. My rights were violated. So it's not part of our conservative culture, but it needs to be because those are the battlefields on which the left is fighting as well. Well, uh, squarely at the center of that battlefield, Harmeet, Dylan, we thank you for being with us and we wish you continued success in the courts. We appreciate it. And everywhere you, else as well. We're following. Thank you. We're, we're welcome. Good to have you here. We're following breaking news out of Ohio. Uh, the polls have uh, just closed in Ohio's 12th congressional district. It's a heated race between President Trump's uh, endorsed candidate, Republican Troy Balderson, and Democratic candidate Danny O'Connor. We'll have you, uh, we'll be bringing you the very latest as soon as the numbers uh, start coming in from the 12th District. And up next, the Mendocino Fire, becoming the largest fire in California's history. We'll have the latest on the efforts to bring that uh, fire uh, under control uh, right now. Uh, it's a long ways away. We'll have the latest for you here next. Stay with us. We'll be right back after these messages. Well, the Dems and the radical left are making much of the so-called collusion that they are ignoring altogether. The Democratic president, who ignored not only Russia and deeply pervasive cyber attacks, not only on our government, including our Congress, the, the Senate, the White House, email systems, but also on corporate America and U.S. multinationals, it's becoming ever clearer that the bipolar world we left behind with the collapse of the Soviet Union and Marxist-Leninism is now being replaced by the ruthless authoritarian regime of Vladimir Putin and his deadly arsenal of nuclear weapons and ICBMs that are at the very least a match for most of U.S. weaponry. The paramount concern in geopolitics, it seems to me, is whether the United States can create sufficiently strong alliances, particularly with Europe, to forestall the emerging alliance between two communist states, both led now by men who are effectively dictators with few, if any, constraints on their power, their authority, and their designs. Joining us tonight is Paul Bracken. He's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, professor of political science and business at Yale University. And, Paul, it's great to have you back with Good us. Good to be here. Uh, let, let's start with first the, the design here. Uh, China uh, is very clearly pursuing uh, a, a, a plan. Uh, it is less clear, I think, to most of us what Russia's intent is. Uh, your thoughts? My thoughts, what Russia's trying to do is to disrupt any notion of the U.S. leading a liberal international order. 
Mm-hmm. So they're going to oppose the United States, whether it is in Syria, whether it's trading in North Korea, with North Korea, whether it's trying to break apart the EU or any way they can, uh, as long as it opposes the United States power, because they know we are going to provide the most clear alternative to this authoritarian kind of government they have there. And China. China, it seems to me, is even more clear, which is they're trying to build up hegemony in East Asia, mm-hmm. number one. They have a huge economic strategy with the One Belt program to increase Chinese exports. So they're investing enormous amounts of money in Indonesia and Sri Lanka and places like that. And they're going head to head with us on the business front. Chinese automobiles and other companies are about to go global. They haven't done that. And most Americans don't know that that's coming. That's what you're going to see in the next two to three years. And most Americans, I believe... Professor, do not understand the presence of China in the United States, whether it be in our markets, whether it be in our economy, uh, whether it be Silicon Valley, our our most advanced uh, technologies uh, are being stolen. uh, But their presence is as obvious as can be uh, in our society. There's been an enormous number of Chinese mergers and acquisitions. Chinese desire to dominate certain markets is now driving global antitrust policy Mm -hmm. where they vetoed a recent deal with one of our companies. And the big thing that I see is they're not only getting our technology, but they're getting our critical military technology. Okay, the uh, recent study came out with this astounding number, 16 percent, one six, 16 percent of all venture capital deals in the U.S. in the last four years at Chinese participation. Wow. If you know anything about venture capital, this means that they looked at 40 to 50% of the deals. I don't think anybody has seen 40 to 50% of the deals. Uh, that, that is a, a sobering thought, both statistics, to think that they're looking at that many deals, which means that they are getting access to extraordinary uh, technology and an extraordinary look into the future of uh, America itself, not only uh, our advanced technology and corporate uh, powers, uh, but the country itself. 16% participation in the deals is stunning. It's absolutely astounding. I don't know why people don't more about, know more about this. The key things they're going after are, guess what, artificial intelligence, right. autonomous vehicles, robotics, financial technology. I mean, we really need to think through the consequences of this And you're starting to see a reaction against this in the U.S., in Washington, Mm -hmm. and also in Germany. I I think people also, Americans need to understand clearly that this administration, the Trump administration, is the first in decades in which CFIS, the uh, Committee on uh, Financial Investment in the United States, which has a veto over any of these deals with foreign participation, is actually for the first time uh, vetoing deals, stopping right. deals, particularly with Chinese participation, uh, because it basically for decades has been a rubber stamp process. Right. The Trump administration is saying, no, we're looking at it strategically and in the national interest. They've done two good things. One is on CFIS, where they're looking at, right. they're reviewing many of these deals. That needs to be strengthened. The other thing they're doing is cracking down on export licenses for technology, which is what's really hurting the North Koreans and the Iranians. That other countries, we sell something to another country, then they resell it to those countries. We're going after them now. And I want to close. We're a bit over time, but uh, I certainly want you to give your thoughts on how soon we could expect, if you expect at all, to see a a merger of interest uh, between China uh, and Russia. I think you already do see a, a merger of interest. Uh, Russia is trading with North Korea, something that China wants to prop up the North Korean state. There's a lot of things coming down the road. Some of the most advanced missile carriers we see in China were old SS-20 Russian missile carriers, which the Russians privately assured us they would not sell to anyone. Right. We now have photographs of them in, in, uh, highly red, in red Square. Uh, highly successful weapons. Yeah, they're, it's a very good weapon system. Yes. Paul Bracken, Professor of Political Science and Business at Yale. Great to have you with us. Appreciate Thank you. It. Always good to talk with you. The Mendocino Complex fire has turned into the largest wildfire in California's entire history. The fire that has grown to nearly the size of Los Angeles has burned across almost 300,000 acres. It's destroyed 75 homes in Northern California. Thousands have been evacuated. 
Only 20% of that fire is now considered contained. Nearly 4,000 firefighters are still battling the massive fire that is growing by the day. Up next, the Trump administration considering a new proposal to limit citizenship for illegal immigrants who choose to live on taxpayer money. We'll have that story, and the Wall Street Journal's James Freeman joins me here next. Stay with us. We'll be right back. The Trump administration considering a new plan to limit legal immigration. Legal immigrants who use welfare programs, including food stamps and Obamacare, could be under this new program, be denied green cards or permanent residency under the administration's proposal. The Trump administration says the changes to current rules can be made without congressional authority. And joining us tonight, James Freeman, who's assistant editor at the Wall Street Journal, Fox Business contributor, and co-author of the brand new, newly released book. Here it is, the title, Borrowed Time, Two Centuries of Booms, Busts, and Bailouts at City. Uh, first, James, congratulations on the book, and great to have you with us. We recommend it to you highly. Uh, he, uh, James is a terrific journalist, obviously, and this is a terrific book. And, wow. Uh, Thanks, Lou. City, and Citibank is such an institution in our, uh, in our economy, our society, uh, and also, obviously, needless to say, the city. Uh, what, what made you gravitate to this uh, extraordinary institution? Well, the, uh, my co-author, Vern McKinley, who's the brains of the operation, of course, came to me and he, he had I love that interesting, false modesty. interesting research that uh, basically it, it said when this was a, a free market bank, not backed by government for the right. first century of its That's existence. That's been a long time ago. Huh? It was, but uh, the golden age, about a right. 80 to 100 years, uh, it was... Uh, stronger and healthier in many ways than it's been for the last century when it's been supported by the government. Now, as you know, it's gone through these various crises over the years, not just 2008. You know, you know I'm tempted to, to interject and say yes, and, the, and the, uh, the, that age uh, was supported by tariffs, of all things. And this, this country uh, had uh, significant tariffs uh, to protect uh, a, a booming economy that kept booming. Uh, it was an extraordinary period. Uh, can I turn to this extraordinary sure. period yes, sir. Uh, and, and an extraordinary leader and, and Donald Trump? This economy is defying all of the so-called classic orthodox establishment uh, under a contract to some corporation or association economists it is. That in all of academia. And it is so wonderful to look out and see 4.1% growth in the GDP. Uh, you know, Nancy Pelosi trying to comprehend the impact of a record low unemployment rate yeah. among Hispanics, uh, uh, among blacks in this country, and, and watch their feeble responses, which are basically just nailing, uh, you know, they're, they're just wailing and uh, gnashing their teeth and having little fits. It's, a, it's kind of a fun time for anyone in this economy. It's a great <laughs> job market. And as you said, it's, it's quieted a lot of people oh who... Gosh. Uh, we're making excuses during the Obama years. We think of a lot of the former officials from that administration. You don't talk. hear much from them, do right, you? Right, right. Well, this was secular stagnation. We were just doomed the to new a normal. future of low growth, and yeah. there was nothing we could do about it. And so it is exciting. And, and I think given that here we are 10 years after the financial crisis, uh, the president's policies have, have shown a lot of success in reviving the economy. And, and I would say... Um, Maybe it's time to make banking great again in terms of um, letting banks fail again, letting uh, letting right. them succeed and fail with less regulation, but also less federal support. I think uh, I think it's a good time to consider that. And the banks, of course, built on federal support. Yes. Uh, with, with the with the Federal Reserve System, uh, it's impossible uh, with a Treasury that is so so frightened of uh, the uh, a future that they don't know how to deal with a new positive plan to our future. James Freeman, will you come back next week and we can continue? I promise this? I will. I have, uh, I've talked this into short time uh, here at the end of the program. <laughs> it's never happened before. <laughs> so it must be clearly your fault. James, Thanks, again, congratulations on the book. Thank you, sir. Borrowed time, two centuries of booms and busts and bailouts at City, and a few other banks as well. We're following breaking news now out of Ohio. Polls there have closed in Ohio's uh, special election in the 12th Congressional District. It's a heated race between Trump endorsed Republican Troy Balderson, Democrat Danny O'Connor. O'Connor leading Balderson by around uh, 35 points. 
uh, with just a uh, uh, one less than one percent of the precincts have uh, reported. Uh, Democratic areas surrounding uh, Columbus are coming in right now. We're told we'll have more when we come right back. Stay with us. Well, it was a critical day of testimony in the trial of Paul Manafort. The star witness, Rick Gates, his former associate, drilled on his secret life. Judge Pirro gave us her verdict on the case. The Manafort trial is about convicting Paul Manafort in an effort to then squeeze him to turn on Donald Trump. In the end, the jury will decide based upon the facts. There you have it, Judge Janine, with the condensed version of what's going on, and a brilliant one it is, of course. All eyes now on Ohio's 12th district in the last special congressional election before the midterms, and a Kansas gubernatorial primary, uh, and Rollins predicting the Trump-endorsed candidates, Troy Balderson, Chris Kobach, and all the others endorsed by the president will prevail in their elections tonight. And violent left-wing Antifa protests breaking out in left-wing cities across the country. Attorney RNC Committee Woman Harmeet Dillon tonight telling us the Department of Justice is simply missing in action. And that is a shame. That's it for us tonight, and we thank you for being with us. Be sure to join us tomorrow when we focus on the Dems, the radical Dems, the deep state. Former Congressman Jason Chaffetz with us as his former federal prosecutor, Sidney Powell. Please join us. Good night from New York.